with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Good Lord, everybody. We're going to take up our tithe and offering really quick. Amen. Bring our first fruits into the house of the Lord. And return a little bit of what he's blessed us with. Amen. Let's read our scripture together. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Amen. Let's bring it this evening.
if you know him to be more than enough. Hey man, why don't you get off from where you're standing, shake about five people's hands and let them know how happy you are to see them in the house of the Lord this evening. Praise the Lord, everybody. Oh, let's try that again. Praise the Lord, everybody. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord on Tuesday evening? Amen, amen. What a wonderful time, a wonderful season to be in the house of the Lord. We do have just a couple reminders. Please remember, if you want to participate in the Secret Sisters of 2023, you will need to turn in your paperwork by Sunday evening, December the 18th. Also, if you want to be involved in caroling, that's going on this Saturday. Sister Hyung is heading that up with Regeneration Youth Ministries. If you want to be a part of that, please see her and she can give you the details. And men's prayer is this Saturday at 8.30 a.m. And then put it on your calendars right now. There will be one service Christ yeah, Christian morning. There will be one service Christmas morning. I guess it's Christian morning. One service Christmas morning. It will be right here at 11 a.m. There will be no afternoon, no evening services, and no Sunday school. So there will be one Sunday service right here in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. on December 25th. And as you all know, we are in the Christmas season. There is only one person excited about Christmas. <laughs> and y'all can go sit down. I'm not going to I'm not going to sing, I don't think. <clears throat> and you know during this season, this is a season of celebration. It really is. This is a season of celebration and generally people just having fun with people that they love. Family, friends, and in preparation for this this afternoon, a couple of reasons to celebrate begin to cross my mind. One reason people celebrate, and this might be the younger amongst us and few of us older ones, and that is Santa Claus. Some people are just convinced that Santa Claus is the one that brings the present. And God forbid that you tell them otherwise. If you tell them, their parents might threaten you. <laughs> and so some people, they celebrate Santa Claus. Um, others, and I doubt there are any amongst us, but if there are, it's always a good time to repent. But there are some in the world that celebrate this season, and what they celebrate is not really Christmas or its spirit. They celebrate consumerism. And this is the season where it's all about getting the latest and the greatest that a consumer's market has to offer. Just a couple days ago, Bishop was discussing the fact that Santa Claus actually got his red suit 
from our beloved Coca-Cola. And that's actually why Santa Claus wears a red suit. I don't know about that. You could take that up with Bishop. But that is just an idea of consumerism making its way into this holiday season because of the tradition of giving gifts. And yet others celebrate family and the joy of being together during this time. Now we've mentioned three separate reasons to celebrate. Some of them good, some of them bad. But there are many other reasons why people celebrate this time of the year. And we're going to talk about one of those tonight. So, if we could open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 7, and then we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Isaiah 9 and 1 says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted her in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. The joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then quickly turning to Matthew 2 and 1. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1 reads, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And for just a few minutes, with the help of the Holy Ghost, the title I give us for the sake of remembering this evening is this, a reason to celebrate. A reason to celebrate. Could we lay our Bibles down and pray that God would have his way? Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for another opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for every person that's here this evening, God, whether they're here in person or whether they're tuning in online. Thank you for every person that will hear this in the future. Let your word accomplish what you have sent it to do, Jesus. We know it will not return void. Give us ears to hear. Give us minds to understand. God, give us hearts to receive your word. Give us hands and feet to go out and to put action to your word, Jesus. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And everyone said in Jesus' name, you may be seated. One of our texts this evening comes from the book of Matthew. There are actually two separate accounts of Jesus' birth. 
which we could have read from this evening, many people would read the account of Luke as it is more detailed. But we read from Matthew because this writer sets out to establish three points in his account of Jesus' birth and Jesus' early childhood. One of those points is the birthing place of this sermon tonight and from which God would like to speak to His people. In Craig Bloomberg's book, Jesus and the Gospels, the writer begins to draw these three points from Matthew's account to the surface. One of these three points is that there is a pretender to the throne while Jesus, the true king of Israel, is arriving onto the scene of earth. This pretender to the throne is mentioned in our text from Matthew. That's why we chose it as a text. Herod, or some would call him Herod the Great. Because of Herod's friendship with the emperor of Rome, and some other flimsy family claims, Herod was placed in charge of a large swath of land which included Israel. Thus, Herod the Great's claim to being the king of the Jews. And when you study Herod the Great, everything seems to have been going fairly well for that time period in that area of the world. Everything seemed to be going fairly well in Herod the Great's life and in his rule. Herod was, some would say, a continuous, spontaneous builder. He loved to build. He loved to build palaces. He loved to build fortresses and strongholds. And so Herod is busy in his life divulging into all manner of sin and wickedness because he was a very wicked man. And he is also satisfying his desire to build. And if you want after church, you can go and study several different things that they've dug up that Herod the Great built while he was king of this area. But Herod runs into an issue in his rule and his reign. Everything in his kingdom seems to be going fine until the arrival of the Magi. Once the Magi arrive, it begins to bring disturbing news to Herod's rule and Herod's reign. Matthew 2 and 2 says... Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now this would be fine if the Magi were saying it to just anybody. They are asking this question of the king of this area right now. They are asking Herod the Great. Where is this king? Where is this king that is born king of of the Jews. And I'm sure that there was some, what Herod felt like was misunderstanding. Well, you're talking to the king of the Jews. No, we're not. We're looking for the king of the Jews. No, I am definitely the king of the Jews. No, we're not looking for you. <laughs> and this must have disturbed Herod the reason why is Herod did not have a true claim to this kingship. He was usurping this throne. He was an imposter to the throne. One, because his family did not really deserve this because they were not really Israelites. And also because he did not come from the Davidic line and therefore prophecy proclaimed one that would come from King David to rule on this throne. Herod, growing up in Palestine amongst the Jews, was very familiar with the doctrine and the belief that there would come a Messiah from the lineage of David who would rule and reign as a physical king over Palestine. 
And so it must have aroused fear within him. We know that it definitely aroused him because of what Peter, or yeah, Peter, because of what Herod does. No, Peter, you can't be in this sermon tonight. I'm sorry. Because of what Herod does. This throws the king into a panicked frenzy and he hatches a plot to find and kill this king which has just been born. Matthew 2, 3 through 8 says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently, what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Obviously, we know this is a lie. Herod has already weaseled his way into possessing this throne, and he's definitely not going to go and simply worship someone who is the rightful heir of this throne and so he sends the magi off to do the dirty work of finding the king in hopes that they will come back and tell him that they have located the king and bring word back to Herod that the child has been found and thus can be slain but the plot doesn't work verses 11 through 14 and when they were coming to the house they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise. And take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And thus, Herod's slaying or Herod's orders to slay all of the male children of Bethlehem Follow, But let us stop just long enough to point this out. The thing that saved this child was a messenger. Now we know that it was an angel from the Lord. And some debate as to if we went to Revelation. And it speaks about the angels of the churches. Some debate whether those are men or those are angels. But do not simply run past a messenger standing in your life and telling you of judgment to come and offering you a way out. The only thing that saved this child was a messenger sent from God that appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, the child is going to be sought so that they can kill him and you must flee away into Egypt. Now, there's a lot of prophecy and cool stuff here that perhaps another time we could talk about and maybe one day we can twist bishop's arm because bishop preaches a really good sermon about these wise men i was trying to find it this afternoon and i can't remember the title so bishop if you hear this when you get home could you please preach to us about the wise men <laughs> but after a while herod figures out okay the magi aren't coming back thus herod orders the slaying of the male children of Bethlehem. We find this in Matthew 2 and 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Brother Richard, if you'd come, I'm almost done. 
And we know what happens. If you don't know what happens, Jesus escapes with his family into Egypt. And after Herod the Great has died, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph and tells him that it is safe to go back to Palestine. And so Jesus comes back and they settle in Galilee. And all of these minute details, when studied, are fulfillments to Old Testament prophecy. But we're not here to preach about prophecy tonight. And some of us are sitting here right now saying, Okay, thank you for reminding us of the account of Jesus' birth. We all know that that's what Christmas is truly about. It is the celebration of Jesus' birth. We're sitting here saying, thank you for that nice, concise reminder of Jesus' birth. And we know this is the reason for the season. But do we really? And why do we celebrate and rejoice Jesus' birth? The reason why is because you and I also live with a pretender to the throne of our lives. Many times we refer to him as Satan. You see, Herod is really just a pawn in the hands of Satan as Satan tries to usurp the throne from Christ. And it's no different today. Satan sits in our lives. Somewhere in the background, him and his imps are constantly trying to convince us that they are the omnipotent beings of our world. But they are not the omnipotent beings of our world. Satan and the fallen angels are usurpers of the power that they have. They stole it from Adam. But if we're not careful... They whisper in our ears and tell us that, no, we're the king of your life. And they're just like Herod the Great. One of their favorite things to do is to build strongholds. They come into your life and they begin to build strongholds, uh, family curses and strongholds of divorce and strongholds of addiction and strongholds of abuse and strongholds of confusion why? Because usurpers of the throne are always petrified that the people being ruled are going to figure out that throne does not belong to you. Satan is no different this evening. He is absolutely terrified of you hearing the words of yet another messenger tonight that proclaims, Where is he that is born the true king, for we have seen his star and are come to worship him. Satan is petrified of you figuring out that there is an omnipotent being that does reign supreme with all power. And he does build strongholds, but not strongholds of addiction. And not strongholds of unbelief and doubt. And not strongholds of divorce and chaos. No, Satan is petrified that you will encounter the true king of your life. Why? Because the devil knows if you can ever find that king and you ever begin to worship that king, his days, Satan's days of ruling you are numbered. This is why we took another text from Isaiah. Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. And then he continues on and says, uh, Of the increase of his government and kingdom. There is no end. This is why Satan is petrified of you figuring out that no, there's a king. And he builds strongholds, but they're not the strongholds that Satan builds. They're the strongholds of joy and peace and love 
and gentleness and meekness and temperance and faith. And so Satan tries as long as he can. But if you will heed the words of messengers sent to you, there is a true king. One could jump to the end of Jesus' life and find what's written over his head on the cross. Jesus, King of the Jews. It's the same way for us. Jesus is the true King of your life. And so the true reason, the real reason we celebrate Christmas is not consumerism. It's not Santa Claus in his red suit. It's not even the giving of gifts. And while we do thank God for our family and friends, it's not even the reason we celebrate is not even our family and friends. The true reason that we celebrate Christmas is because Christ was born, but not that just he was born. We celebrate that he conquered all. He conquered death hell and the grave. He conquered Satan, the pretender to the throne. He conquered the sin that tries to bind you. He conquered the addiction that tries to bind you. He conquered the oppression and the depression and the anxiety that stands in your life and says, I'm the king. I'm the ruler. No, there is one that reigns higher than that tonight. And he stands in this room tonight and he offers you love and he offers you peace and he offers you life eternal why because he is the true king why don't we stand this evening and so this is why we celebrate Christmas and I know some people don't that's fine we all know more than likely Jesus was not born on December 25th if you didn't know that, I apologize for bursting your bubble. The point is not we celebrate because it was December 25th. The point is we celebrate because it happened. Because if Jesus could come and conquer sin, he can offer me a way to conquer sin. If Jesus could come and say, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, then I can be of good cheer because if I can get in Christ, I can overcome the world. This is the beauty of Christmas. This is why we celebrate his birth. We celebrate his birth because if he can be born and die and rise again, then I too can rise again. Over all the anxiety over all the fear, over all the doubt. I can rise over all the family curses. We can rise over all the addiction. We can rise over all the depression and all of the wickedness and sin of this world. Why? Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So tonight, be encouraged. This is why we celebrate. If you want to come to the front, you can. I don't necessarily feel an altar call. But if you want to come and pray, we always have time for that. But remember that this holiday season. We're going to celebrate family. We should. We're going to celebrate. We're going to exchange gifts. We're going to exchange gifts and love and, and, and be just have fun. But above all that, remember, celebrate that there is a true king who has overcome death, hell, and the grave. And because he has overcome death, hell, and the grave, you can overcome death, hell, and the grave. Why don't we lift our hands right now? Jesus, we love you. Oh, thank you for your word, God. Thank you for this season. Thank you for your promise to us. Thank you for coming down, God. Thank you for being a man. Thank you for conquering the sin of this world so that we can conquer the sin of this world. Thank you for making a way through all of this chaos for us, God.
for making a way out. We worship you. We praise you, Jesus. We magnify you. Hallelujah. Amen. During this holiday season, please be mindful of people that maybe their family, maybe they might not have family or their family might be too far and they can't make it. Christian Rose Center, let's please include them. Let's include them into this season. Let's include them into the family and the body of Christ. Also, there will be youth service this Friday evening at 7 p.m. right here. Prayer will begin at 7 p.m. Church will begin at 7.30. Once again, please remember the events on Saturday, and then we will have church right here Sunday morning at 11 a.m. God bless you. Love one another. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.